Thanks a lot for your introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here today and to share um, a little bit of what we've been doing over the last couple of years on the topic of uh, microvascular lesion formation in the context of cerebral small vessel disease. Um, so uh, this is just a couple of examples of the conventional MRI markers of cerebral small vessel disease uh, that some of you are probably uh, familiar with. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, microbleeds on a gradient echo sequence in the cortex. On the right-hand side, we see white matter hyperintensities in the white matter and lacunar infarcts. And these lesions are sort of considered the hallmark lesions of small vessel disease that uh, uh, track with cognitive decline and increase the risk of strokes in older individuals. And this is pretty common in, in older uh, individuals in the general population. So these are considered sort of the, the hallmark manifestations of small vessel disease on conventional MRI. But when you look under the microscope, so when you ask a neuropathologist what small vessel disease is, he would show you pictures like this. So this is very different than what we see on MRI. So here are just a couple of examples of actual disease of the small vessels in the brain. Uh, here's an example of uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, so where the protein amyloid accumulates in the walls of cortical vessels and leads to stiff vessels and reduced vessel function and eventually in brain lesions. On the right-hand side is an example of a vessel in the white matter with an enlarged perivascular space. And here you can see vessels that are affected by hypertension. You see these, these thick vessel walls with lipohyalinosis. And in the lower right corner is a cortical microinfarct. So I think it becomes immediately clear that this is not what we pick up with MRI. So there's a big discrepancy with, between what we see on MRI and we call the manifestations of small vessel disease uh, versus what we see under the microscope is considered small vessel disease at the pathological level. The size scales, yeah, the scale is a bit small, but this is about two millimeters, the span of the cortex. This is about 50 or 100 micrometers. Um, so they're very, very small. So the challenges in, in small vessel disease research is uh, twofold, I think. And one is that clinical MRI does not capture the whole small vessel disease burden. So the MRI, we only see the larger manifestations of small vessel disease, but we are uh, missing some of the smaller ones. So this is just a cortical microinfarct, about 200 microns in diameter. And this is something we are very hard to pick up with conventional MRI in living individuals. And the second challenge is that we have an incomplete understanding of the pathology underlying some of these small vessel disease markers, uh, such that, uh, for instance, for white matter hyperintensities, we still don't fully understand what the pathological alterations are of these vessels underlying this disease and what causes these manifestations in MRI. So we and others have been using advanced neuroimaging techniques such as uh, DTI and high field MRI to try to bridge the gap between in vivo and pathology in this context, as well as ex vivo MRI histopathological investigation so that we can fully understand what is underlying these, uh, these MRI abnormalities under the microscope. And what I'd like to do, uh, the first half of my talk is give a little bit of an overview of some of the studies that we've been doing trying to address these issues in the context of small vessel disease. And I'm going to focus mainly on cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is uh, one of the two most common uh, manifestations of uh, small vessel disease in older individuals. So CAA is uh, fairly common in older uh, individuals and is uh, characterized pathologically by the accumulation of amyloid data in the walls of cerebral vessels. So this is just an overview section. This is a brain section of a patient uh, that came to autopsy and we stained it with uh, amyloid data. So it's the same uh, peptide that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. But in the context of CAA, we see it accumulating in the walls of cortical and leptomeningeal vessels in the brain. And this is pretty severe. Here we're zooming in on a small piece of the cortex. We see many vessels that have complete circumferential amyloid data in the walls. Um, so this makes these vessels very stiff and unable to react and eventually leads to uh, the formation of microvascular lesions such as bleeds and strokes. And CAA is, is fairly common, uh, even in a normal older individual that comes to autopsy, about 25% of these individuals will have some degree of CAA. And in patients with a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's <laughs> disease, it's almost 100% of patients that will also have CAA in pathology. And it correlates with cognitive decline before death as well. And sort of as, uh, to use as a conceptual framework throughout the course of this uh, talk, um, we propose this type of mechanism that may play a role in the, in the context of this disease. And that is that in the context of increased CAA, so increased buildup of amyloid in the vessel walls, we see a loss of smooth muscle cells. So we see increased smooth muscle cell degeneration and vascular injury, which in turn leads to reduced vascular compliance and reduced reactivity. So the vessel function goes down, which then may have an effect on reduced perivascular clearance of amyloid data. We believe that it's clearance alongside the vasculature in the brain that helps get rid of amyloid data. 
And when the vessels don't react anymore or get very stiff due to this amyloid deposition, it also reduces the clearance of pure vascular amyloid beta. And that in turn, you can imagine, feeds into this feed-forward loop of increased pathology, reduced vessel function, and, and overall accumulation of amyloid beta in the brain. And eventually, this leads to microvascular brain lesions such as bleeds and infarcts, as well as dementia in these uh, uh, patients. And I will use this framework sort of to, to guide us through this talk and how we use different types of experiments to, to look at each of these components of this uh, pathophysiological mechanism in this disease. So this is uh, path from the pathology perspective. Um, clinically, these patients are often seen because they develop these large hemorrhagic strokes. And as you can imagine, these are very catastrophic. So uh, many of these patients die as a result of these large bleeds in the, in the brain. But even in the absence of large hemorrhagic strokes, these patients develop uh, high numbers of smaller type lesions that are, uh, can be uh, found throughout the brain. And uh, examples of these smaller lesions are white matter hyperintensity, siderosis, and two that are most commonly um, present are microbleeds and microinfarcts. And I will zoom on these types of lesions um, uh, for this talk because we believe that these two lesions are bleeds and ischemic events that are very small but they occur in high numbers of the brain. So they're widespread in the high numbers of these lesions in the brain, and therefore they can significantly impact the brain structure and function, uh, leading to functional deficits in these patients. So let's look at microbleeds first. Um, so microbleeds have been extensively studied on MRI in these patients' uh, populations because we were actually really good at detecting them. Um, this is a gradient echo sequence, so either gradient echo or susceptibility weighted imaging is very uh, sensitive to detect these small uh, bleeds in the cortex. In these patients, microbleeds often occur in the cortical areas of the brain. Here are just a couple of examples of these microbleeds, and they correlate uh, to an increased risk of hemorrhage in these patients. Not so much to cognitive decline, but more to, to an increased risk of hemorrhage in these patients. So there's as many studies have looked at these lesions on MRI, but on pathology, we often miss these lesions because they're so small, and, uh, and the pathologist doesn't come across these lesions very often. So we and others a couple years ago now did um, a series of studies where we tried to look at the pathology underlying these lesions uh, on, on, under, the micro, under the microscope to actually validate if these are in fact bleeds as we uh, thought they were. Um, so to do this, we used uh, ex vivo MRI and histopathology. So we scanned brain slabs of patients who had a diagnosis of severe CAA, and we subjected these slabs to a high field 7 Tesla MRI. And this is an example of a T2 weighted scan of this part of the slab shown here. And you can see these three microbleeds in the cortex in this patient. And then we do a sectioning to find these same uh, areas to study under the microscope. And this is the corresponding h &E stain section of this particular area. So we see these three, one, two, three, these three bleeds here, one, two is a bit bigger, and number three. So then when we zoom in and look at what these lesions actually are, uh, we found that the majority of these lesions consist of these focal hemosiderin laden macrophages uh, that is very indicative of an old microhemorrhage. So indeed, these bleeding uh, that looks like bleeds on MRI are in fact the signature of old microhemorrhages in the brain. Um, and when we stain these adjacent sections for iron, we actually see that they're uh, very iron positive. And we believe this is what makes them so visible on MRI, uh, because as you know, uh, it's very sensitive for iron. Because if you look at the scale bar here, this is 100 microns. So this lesion is not much bigger in diameter than 200 microns. The fact that it's so iron positive makes it visible in MRI. Because if you look, it's this lesion here, number three, it almost spans the entire cortical ribbon, which is uh, almost two millimeters in diameter. So it appears much bigger than it in reality is. And that's why we're so good at detecting them during life. Have an risk of yes, that's the next slide. <laughs> so at the very other end of the spectrum uh, are infarcts. So it's ischemic events. <laughs> And uh, for micro, so this, these are micro infarcts, so these are very, very small at the order of uh, less than one millimeter in diameter. And this is kind of a, a different story than micro bleeds, because micro infarcts, we were not able to, to see them on MRI very well, but we knew they existed based on large autopsy studies. So when you do a routine autopsy, uh, approximately 25% of, of normal older individuals will have a few micro infarcts. In Alzheimer's disease, about 50%, in vascular dementia and CAA, it's almost like 80 or 100%. So this is very, very common um, micro ischemic pathology that we often see in just a routine autopsy. So you can imagine that the, the total number of these micro might be much higher than we can readily appreciate from a microscopic uh, observation. So we were interested in trying to find an MRI signature of these lesions to see if we can actually detect them on MRI in, an in vivo study the clinical correlates. 
So again, we did a similar type of approach where we scanned postmortem um, human brain tissue of patients with CAA to find the equivalent of a microinfarct on MRI. So we just looked at signatures of like small strokes that are T2 hyperintense, as we know from larger strokes. And here's an example of such a small T2 hyperintense lesion in the cortex that indeed turned out to be a microinfarct. This is a very specific marker. So all, almost all of these lesions that are T2 hyperintense in cortex turn out to be microinfarct in pathology. Um, and this helped us to then go back to in vivo MRI and device rating criteria for detection of these lesions first on high field seven Tesla MRI and later on also on three Tesla MRI. Um, so this is just an example of a microinfarct on an in vivo seven Tesla MRI scan. This is work we performed in Utrecht in the Netherlands in a high field group. And um, so these lesions are flare or T2 hyperintense and T1 hypointense and are restricted to the cortical ribbon. And these lesions are, can be observed in approximately 25% of uh, older individuals. And the numbers go up in Alzheimer's disease and CAA. And so if you're interested, we devised rating criteria for the detection of these lesions um, that is now available for larger data sets to look at the longitudinal consequences of these lesions and their clinical um, uh, characteristics. So these are just a couple of examples of how we use ex vivo MRI and histopathology to understand better the etiology of some of these lesions and to find lesions on MRI that we weren't able to detect before. But what about the underlying mechanisms of these lesions? It's nice we can detect them. What does it actually mean and how do they come about? Um, so when I came to Boston, I actually set out to try to look a little bit deeper into this question. So what is the underlying uh, pathology or the pathophysiology rather of these lesions? And specifically the relationship to CEA severity and the sequence of events that lead up to the formation of these lesions. And to try to answer those questions, we uh, started a larger um, autopsy uh, cohort study. So we receive intact hemispheres of patients with a clinical diagnosis of CA. This is through the Stroke Research Center uh, led by Stephen Greenberg at the main campus. And so far, we've been able to include 20 brains of patients with a CA diagnosis and four-ish controls. And we do a whole intact hemisphere scanning at three Tesla MRI in an overnight session. And obviously, the advantage of doing a whole brain instead of slab is that we can look at volumetric um, abnormalities and do tractography, for instance, with a DTI scan at vivo to look at those more subtle microvascular alterations and microstructural alterations. Um, so the processing pipeline of these brains after we've uh, collected all of our scans is that we cut them in coronal uh, one centimeter thick slabs. And we take standard sections from uh, four areas of the brain. So from the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital. And those four predefined standard uh, areas that we sample, we then stain with a bunch of different stains. This is just an example of a myelin stain in those four areas. And for this particular project that I'm showing today, we also performed uh, some additional scans uh, at higher resolution to look at uh, the microvascular lesions in more detail. So this is just an example in one case where we do a cross-section here in, at the level of the parietal lobe and occipital lobe. We see a bunch of microbleeds here. So we sampled this area because we knew there were lots of lesions there. And we subjected this sample to a uh, uh, seven Tesla MRI. So this is a scan that we did with a solenoid coil uh, about, I think it was like one or two days of scanning uh, at 75 microns. We we're able to see much and uh, many more lesions than we see on three Tesla MRI. And then the advantage of doing this is that we can then take the whole sample and do serial sectioning throughout the whole thing so that we can retrieve every single microbleed and microinfarct that was detectable in MRI. And that allows us to really look at the individual vessels that feed into these lesions and to figure out what is wrong at the single vessel level um, to figure out what is the, the pathologies that, that give rise to these lesions. So uh, first, when we, receive, uh, when we collect these scans, we look at microbleeds and microinfarcts. Um, just, just a couple of examples. So this is a representative brain of a patient with CAA. You see a big uh, hematoma here in the cortex, and here there's another one, it's a much older one. But also these microbleeds that are um, widespread throughout the brain. And this is a zoom in to cortical microbleeds. And this is uh, the T uh, turbospin echo scan where we look at microinfarcts. And this is a letter resolution of 500 um, uh, microns, isotropic. So we annotate each of these lesions in the brain, um, and then we can do surface renderings and 3D projections to see where they actually are. And the first thing that we observed is that microbeads um, show this kind of anterior to posterior gradient, so they're more heavily 
uh, present in the posterior parts of the brain, which is something we already knew from in vivo studies and believe this is because CA is more abundant in the occipital lobes in these cases. That's why it makes sense that they occur there. And microinfarcts we tend to see more often in these frontal parietal regions, which may be sort of the, um, the end vascular territories of the vessels. And we believe it's maybe because these areas are more prone to hypoperfusion, and that is why we see more microinfarcts in those areas. Um, the total numbers of lesions that we observe in this data set, and this is a total number of 12 brains that we um, analyzed for this study, was about uh, almost uh, like 1,168 microleads in total and uh, 472 microinfarcts. So it appears that we see uh, many more microbleeds on MRI compared to microinfarcts. But we know from pathology that it's actually the other way around, that the presence of microinfarcts is much higher in the brain compared to microbleeds. And it has to do with the detection uh, of these lesions. And to illustrate this discrepancy a little bit better, um, this is just a case example. So this is another brain where we see, uh, we uh, made a surface rendering of the ex vivo brain and we put all the lesions there. Uh, and in blue again are the microbleeds and in yellow are the microinfarcts. In this particular case, um, as in all cases, we take these four sections of the brain, as I told you earlier, and we stain. And then we look also for microinfarcts and microbeads under the, mi under the microscope, sort of blinded to MRI. In this particular case, what we saw is that on MRI, we saw almost 200 microbeads, but on pathology, in those four sections, only two. Whereas for microinfarcts, we saw 10 microinfarcts on, in those four sections under the microscope, but only 64 were detectable in the whole brain. So this already gives, uh, gives away that we can see only a very small amount of the total number of microinfarcts that are present in the brain on MRI. And this was something that was already unknown for a while, and this is nicely described in this paper. It was done here at MGH, where they did a sort of extrapolation study based on routine autopsy samples. So here they did a, in routine um, neuropathological data set, looked at the number of microinfarcts on routine samples, and then sampled a little bit more to see what the actual numbers in the brain would be. And uh, based on this paper, this um, estimated that if you see about nine microinfarcts in just a few samples on routine autopsy, the actual estimated total number of microinfarcts is closer to 5,000. So if we then translate this to this brain where we only detected 60 or so, you can already tell that we only detected tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot more that we don't see on MRI. Whereas for microbleeds, we're actually in a pretty good range. We can, you probably see the, the number that is actually present in the brain. Absolutely. Yeah, but when you... Absolutely, yeah. So we have to go uh, to, to higher resolution and higher field strength to, to detect more. But we already see like in vivo, for instance, when we've scanned patients both at 70 and 3T, and you start to see more at 70, obviously, but when you go higher, you'll start to see more. Um, but there's still a lot of lesions, even at this resolution. And if you even go high, we've done, we went up to like 100 microns in a single slabs, so you still miss a few. So you're absolutely right, like go higher, you see more. But it seems that microscopy is still um, much more sensitive for microinfarct detection. <laughs> yeah. So when you say that the uh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the MR is a yes. If you can actually, yeah, if you, have, if you see the same ones. Yeah. yeah, we've done, so it's a little harder to go directly from three tests to an individual section. The section has six microns, and it's really hard to go. We've done that for certain studies, but it's better to add an additional step. So to take a sample subjected to 70 and have like this intermediate step to do that type of translational analysis. Um, but we know that the ones we see on MRI are actual microinfarcts. We validated that in previous studies um, based on slabs scanning. Um, absolutely, yeah. We've done it in one paper where we went from slabs to smaller samples to microscopy. And there we saw that for microinfarcts, even if you go to 100 microns resolution in a single slab, you still miss about, I would say, 60% of microinfarcts that are visible uh, under microscope. And then you can go back and sort of, if you know what's, on, what's under uh, on pathology, you start to see more in retrospect, but um, it's only uh, a fraction of the total number. Yeah. And I think it's also because microbeads, we benefit from this blooming effect because there's iron content, we see them better. Microinfarcts don't have that. So 
you really have to do with the actual size of the lesions. There's no enhanced uh, blooming effect there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. You're just scratching the surface here. Yeah, sometimes when you know from pathology where they are, when you go back to them, you look, oh yeah, wait, I do see something there. So we can do that type of analysis. But if you want to detect them sort of blinded to the pathology, it's going to be much harder because um, you have false positive findings as well. Yeah. Um, so then the advantage of doing this ex vivo is that we can correlate these lesions to uh, pathology burden. And this is something we are still um, have a hard time doing this in vivo. Um, so we wanted to know if these lesions are related to CEA severity. And so the way we analyzed this is we correlated the numbers of detected lesions on MRI to uh, CEA severity and pathology. So again, as I mentioned, we took these four samples from frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe, and we stained them for amyloid beta to uh, uh, come up with a CA severity score. So uh, we devised a composite uh, score based on um, the composite number of the four sections. So each section could get a number between zero and three. So the maximum score was 12. And that's what we plotted here on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the number of lesions that is detected on MRI in these brains, um, both for microbleeds and microinfars. And here I'm just showing you the microbleeds. You can see there is maybe a trend towards a significant correlation, but it wasn't significant. Um, so there's overall poor correlation between the number of microbeads on MRI versus CA on um, pathology. But it's even worse for microinfarcts. So microinfarcts, there was no correlation uh, between the numbers on MRI and CA survey. And that is probably has to do with the detection limits as we don't see all of them that are present in the brain. Um, so then we wanted to zoom in a little bit more, say, okay, this is a global correlation. Can we do this at the, at the regional level or even at the single vessel level? So that's the next step we did. And uh, for this, we used these samples that were subjected to uh, seven Tesla MRI so that we could um, have a higher yield of lesions to look at. So this is just a 75 micron isotropic resolution scan of uh, an area that we already knew had lots of lesions based on the whole brain scan. And you can see that there's like many more lesions that are visible that were otherwise not visible in the cortex in this particular sample. Um, and then afterwards, we take these samples and do serial sectioning as set so that we can retrieve every single lesion and look at them under the pathology or under the microscope. Um, so here's how we detect them uh, on H and E. Um, so this is just an overview section. In this box is a microbleed, um, as shown here by these blood breakdown deposits. Um, so this is the vessel that ruptured. And here we see the blood breakdown deposits around these, uh, this vessel in the tissue. And here's an example of a microinfarct, like an older cavitated microinfarct um, in the cortex. And then we looked at the adjacent sections that were stained for amyloid beta to quantify the local, uh, local CA severity. Um, so here we zoom in. Um, and what we did is we took these lesions and masked them, um, as shown here. So um, each lesion is masked here. We added a bunch of control areas so that we were blinded for lesion location. And then we did a show like analysis of local CA burden. Um, so there are four shells that we devised, so number one, so number two, three, and four. And for each uh, shell, we quantify the number of CAA positive vessels here annotated in green. And this is just the outline of the cortex so that we limited our analysis to just the cortical area. So that's only where the CAA is present. And then what we observed uh, was that when we compared uh, the first shell next to a microbleed here shown in red, when we compared that to a control area, we saw that we're actually a reduced a density of amyloid beta positive vessels in those in the first shell. Whereas for microinfarcts, we saw the opposite effect. We saw that in the first shell adjacent to the lesion, there were actually more CA positive vessels. And this effect uh, went away uh, further away from the lesion. So this may suggest that microinfarcts may occur in areas with increased CA severity, whereas microbleeds may occur in areas with reduced CA severity. And this is in the context of a brain that has lots of CA. So this is all compared to the surrounding uh, tissue. Um, so then we wanted to check if this is actually, or what happens at the single vessel level. So we masked out the individual vessels here because we just uh, limited our analysis to the region surrounding it. So then we wanted to zoom in on the individual vessels that supply the lesion tissue. So again, we used the serial sections to find those uh, vessels. And then we looked at the characteristics of those vessels that have bled or that went uh, and formed an ischemic infarct. 
And this is something, um, this is what we found. Um, this is an example, again, it's the same bleed I showed you uh, just now. And the first thing that we observed is that these vessels were abnormally enlarged. So they didn't look healthy as you would expect. The vessel walls were abnormally enlarged and they didn't contain any amyloid. This is sort of counterintuitive to what you might expect, but these vessels actually had reduced amyloid burden. Um, this is, for instance, compared to this vessel here, where you do see nice circumferential amyloid beta in the wall, but this is not true for the vessel that had ruptured. If you go a little bit further downstream for this vessel, this is just shown in this inset, we actually do see some CAA uh, that is still present in those vessels, but it's kind of fragmented and, and abnormal. So it's not circumferential and nicely in the whole vessel wall, but just um, fragmented. It looks like it's, it's, uh, it's been lost from the vessel wall. And this was true for both older microbleeds and also for more recent ones. So this is just an example of a microbleed that presumably has happened in the last 24 hours before the patient passed away. And we can tell that by the state of the red blood cells that extravasated. So this is the abnormal vessel. It's an arteriole that goes into the cortex. And this is the bleed surrounding this vessel. You can see that the red blood cells that extravasated are kind of lice. So this is indicative of like a 24 hour-ish old bleed. And then when we look at the vessels, Again, with amyloid beta, we see there is no amyloid beta in this walls again, uh, but they are normally enlarged and thick. Other things we observed in these vessels is, was uh, extensive fibrinogen buildup and loss of smooth muscle cells. So here, the example uh, is a fluorescent staining of an acute microbleed stained for smooth muscle cells in green. And you see that most arteries here in the surrounding area have nice circumferential smooth muscle cells, but the one that has ruptured here is almost completely devoid of some muscles. Cells. So this is suggestive of some sort of remodeling pathway that these vessels have undergone. So they become abnormal, they lose their small muscle cells, lose their amyloid beta, and then eventually rupture. So this can be considered a very end stage sort of pathology at the single vessel level leading to these lesions. And um, the reason we think this might be happening is because we also observed vessels that had not ruptured yet in the brains of these patients, but that looked very similar to those vessels. And this is one example. Here's, again, a penetrating cortical arterial that looks very abnormal. It's very widely enlarged. There is like this fibrinoid material in the wall of this vessel and almost no amyloid beta left. So just compare this to this normal vessel here. There's nice circumferential A beta, but it's not here in this widely abnormal vessel. So it's almost completely gone. That's, we don't know, of course, because it's cross-sectional, but it's because we see these types of vessels in brains that bleed a lot, um, we may think that this is kind of the, the, pre, the stage happening before an actual rupture. But it's really hard to tell on a cross-sectional basis. Um, but at least from these observations, we think this might be the case. Um, these, these vessels also lost their small muscle cells, as shown here, and uh, have some fibrinogen um, increase in the vessel wall. And in this particular vessel, it's interesting, we saw some fibrin also, uh, so fibrin is a plasma protein leaks out of the vessels in the context of blood-brain barrier disruption. And we see here some fibrin in cells surrounding this vessel. So it's suggestive of some sort of subtle leakage that happened from this wall, but no actual hemorrhage because we don't see any red blood cells that extravasated from this vessel. So this might represent sort of a pre-stage uh, pathology of vessels at risk for bleeding. And then obviously we looked at microinfarcts to do the same thing. And for microinfarcts, we saw a slightly different pattern. We saw that the vessels that supplied the lesion tissue actually had increased CA severity. So these vessels were very much intact and had lots of CAA. And this was true both for old microinfarcts as well as more acute ones. And we also noticed that these vessels had lost their split muscle cells. So um, at the core of these ischemic, this is kind of this wedge-shaped ischemic area, that's the infarct. And at the core of these lesions are these very heavily amyloid-laden vessels, but without smooth muscle cells. So you can assume that these are very stiff. They're not probably able to react to an increased oxygen demand if necessary in that area, and may lead to uh, ischemic events in those particular areas. So these observations give us some sort of a clue of what may be happening at the mechanistic level, but obviously this is very end stage, and this is very cross-sectional, these are all dead people. Uh, so we need to come up with other ways to look earlier on and to find um, uh, in vivo um, a translation of these observations. Um, but these observations give us an idea of two, two maybe slightly different pathophysiological pathways in small vessel disease. Um, that one of 
pathways might lead to microbeads and the other one might lead to microinfarcts and it might be also differential um, localization in the brain that gives rise to these lesions. Um, so we go back to our conceptual framework and uh, where we add this, this tool that we can use to actually find clues for the underlying etiology and pathophysiology in human tissue and may serve as a bridge to in vivo studies and uh, can be used as a validation of biomarkers. But obviously, as said, there is huge limitations because of its cross-sectional nature and the, the end-stage uh, disease that we're looking at. So we need translational approaches to target preferably early changes in vivo uh, at the single vessel level. And it leads me to the second part of my talk um, to show you some of our in vivo two photo microscopy studies that we do in mice. Because this gives us the, the unique opportunity to look at vessel function in the context of CAA and to see maybe what happens earlier on um, in the vessel that, that leads up to, to microbial formation um, in these animals. It's obviously a model, a model, it's not the same as in humans, but the vasculature is actually pretty much uh, comparable to what we see in, in humans. So we can use it as a nice estimate for what might be happening in, in human brains. So what we do with these mice, uh, we perform craniotomies, in this case over the right visual cortex, so that we can use visual stimulation in the left eye to look at functional reactivity in individual vessels in those areas. Um, and we image these mice awake so that we can, oh, sorry. We image these mice awake so that we can look at um, the, functional, um, the function of these vessels. And before we image these mice, we inject a fluorescent contrast agent, IV, in these animals. And this is shown here in green. This is just a maximum intensity projection taken from the surface of the brain deeper down in the cortex. So you see the vasculature in the cortex of these animals. And when we zoom in on the square here, this is it's a five minute recording of the resting state um, pulsatility of these vessels. This is kind of sped up a little bit faster than usual. But you can see that these vessels, and it's, it's only the arterioles that do that, they um, oscillate. So they spontaneously contract and dilate at a low frequency. And this is not the case for a vein. This, this big guy here is a vein. You see it's not happening there. It's only happening in the arterial. And the mouse is just at rest. It's just sitting there with his head fixed and we can image these um, vessel changes over time. Um, so when we look at the periodicity of this, um, these spontaneous oscillations, we can plot this uh, shown here. So this is over a five minute recording, just a resting state recording. And the y-axis is the percent uh, diameter change of each uh, arterial. So we measure it here. And you can see over a five minute periods of these spontaneous oscillations, about 10% in diameter change that we observed. And when we plot the frequency distribution of this event, it actually centers around 0.1 hertz. And this is known in the literature as phase emotion. And some of you may have been to Kleinfeld's talk a couple weeks ago, may recognize this phenomenon. And he uh, beautifully explained that this may be entrained by neuronal function. This is something we observe in resting state animals. And as said, this is only observed in arterioles. We don't see it in venules. Um, and that's probably because arterioles have some muscle cells that are the contractile apparatus of these vessels. So they um, give rise to this um, pulsations, uh, dilations and contractions. So because we implanted these windows of a visual cortex, we can do a visual stimulation to, uh, to increase vascular reactivity in these animals and increase this phenomenon of phase motion. So here's a recording of a mouse um, where we imaged again for five minutes and showed a flashing checkerboard. And we did this for periods of 10 seconds on and then 10 seconds off, et cetera. And that is what's shown here on this plot. So this is just a frame number, but this is in total five minutes. And on the y-axis again is the percent vessel diameter change and the gray bars is every time the checkerboard is on. So you can see that when the checkerboard comes on, the vessels dilate and about twice as, as, um, as big as the, in the resting state condition. So this is very reproducible and we can use this phenomenon. And when you average the signal, you get these characteristic hemodynamic response functions, which are very uh, similar to the Bolge response with fMRI. And this is the, then the frequency distribution. Um, and you can see that these these plots center around the frequency that we uh, present the mouse with, and it's about tenfold higher than we observe the resting state of phase emotion. So this, now we have like a tool that we can use to increase the vessel response or increase the phase emotion um, um, to look at, at other markers uh, in these mice. And importantly, we can drive these vascular activity at different frequencies, just depending on how we uh, use the checkerboard. We use different frequencies, we can get different frequency um, reactions. 
So then the next question that we ask is, uh, how does this relate to clearance? Because as I said, in, M in CAA, we believe that the increased accumulation of MLU data in the walls of vessels may have something to do with reduced perivascular clearance of this um, peptide. So we know from the literature that perivascular clearance of solutes from the brain is important to maintain healthy uh, brain state. And it is probably um, impaired in the context of Alzheimer's disease and also CAA. It is sort of depicted here in this diagram. So it's um, perivascular clearance of waste products in interstitial fluid, including amyloid data, play a role. And we believe that the vasculature actually uh, are the highways of this clearance pathway uh, from the brain. So we're interested in figuring out if this phase of motion, this low frequency oscillation, might actually be an important driving force of clearance from these brains of these mice. And the way we study this is that you need some sort of fluorescent marker that you can measure um, as a proxy of clearance. So what we did is, as I said, we, uh, before we imaged these mice, we injected fluorescent contrast agent into the vasculature. So what we did is we poked a little hole in one of these venules and to allow the circulating dextrin to leak out into the parenchyma. And that would allow us to then measure the decay of that fluorescent signal over time from the brain uh, uh, parenchyma. And this video is just right after we irradiated this vessel. So you can see there's a clot forming and it's nicely reperfusing. This sort of vessel looks pretty healthy. But dextron has leaked out in the surrounding area. So it's all green here. And you can see that the signal is decaying over time. So this might be a proxy of perivascular or clearance of that fluorescent signal that we can measure alongside the arterial as sort of a proxy for perivascular clearance. So we did this in an eight-month-old wild-type mice. Um, so again, we uh, radiated a nearby venule here, allowing this dextron to leak out. And then we place an ROI alongside these arterioles to measure the decay of that signal over time. And this is the plot that we get. So over a 20 minute period that we measure um, on the X axis and the Y axis, the relative intensity standardized to 10.0. And uh, we get these decay curves as a sort of proxy for clearance rates. So we measure the area under the curve. And then what we observe is that the area under the curve actually correlates with the amplitude of the normal phase of motion in resting state animals. So while we measure the clearance of the signal, we also measure the, the, the dilation of the vessel over time. And we observe that this is nicely correlated. So it suggests that maybe vase motion or the amplitude of the vase motion um, may be a driving force for clearance in these animals. And the next step is that we try to increase the vase motion to see what the effects were on clearance. And nicely, when we turn the checkerboard during these clearance um, events, we saw that it actually sped up clearance rates. So in red is just a normal resting state clearance, and in blue is when we turn on the checkerboard, so we increase the reactivity of the vessels and we also see increased clearance in these animals. And here's just a quantification of the vascular uh, reactivity to make sure it actually worked during the 20 minute period. And indeed we see here in blue when the checkerboard is on, the maximum amplitude of the vasoactivity is indeed significantly increased compared to when the screen is off. So then the logical next step is like, okay, what happens in mice with CAA? Um, so mice that where the vessels don't function very well. So for, this, uh, for these experiments, we use a mouse model um, that is very commonly used in the context of Alzheimer's disease, the APIP PS1 mouse model. And these animals overproduce amyloid beta. And around five months of age, we start to see intraparenchymal plex, as shown here in blue, as well as CAA around the arterioles. Um, and it nicely wraps around sort of in a similar fashion as what we observe in humans, but this is kind of considered mild. So in, in humans with end stage disease, we see that the whole vessel wall is, is replaced by amyloid. This is considered kind of a mild, maybe pre-stage of what we see in humans. But even at this stage, this is about eight to nine months of age in these animals, we already see that the vessels lost some of their functionality. So when we turn on the checkerboard and we compare wild type animals here in blue with transgenics, we see that the average, like the hemodynamic response function is significantly reduced, suggesting that these vessels are not able to completely dilate anymore in response to the, vessel, uh, to the visual stimulation. So these vessels become stiff and don't function very well. Likewise, when we look at clearance in these animals, we also see that they have reduced clearance patterns, um, as shown here in red. And this is while the checkerboard is on. So we, we try to like stimulate these vessels, but it's not working very well. So the clearance is also reduced in these animals. And again, this was correlated with the maximum amplitude of the vasoreactivity in these, in these mice, suggesting that this might be actually driving it. And we think this might have like interesting translational uh, implications because 
um, here at MGH and also in the Netherlands, they've done a bunch of studies looking at um, evoked vascular reactivity in patients with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And this is uh, making use of the bolt response in response to visual stimulation as measured in visual cortex. So this is just controls compared to CAA patients, and these were age matched. And if you look at the bolt response, this is kind of the same hemodynamic response function. Um, if you compare the CA patients to controls, you see that there were, they found significant differences in uh, the, both the amplitude and the time to peak and the time to return to baseline as well. Suggesting that there's something similar is impaired in patients and that these, uh, these vessels in the visual cortex of these patients are not fully functional anymore. Now, interestingly, in, in Leiden, there's a group of uh, patients with a Dutch mutation that developed very early on CAA. So this is a hereditary variant of sporadic CAA that is extensively studied. And um, these patients, uh, they did the similar study in these patients, and they saw in, in these mutation carriers of this Dutch disease is that the hemodynamic response function is even more severely impaired. And these are very young patients. And these were compared to age match controls. And interestingly, when they stratified these groups into uh, symptomatic and non-symptomatic mutation carriers, they saw that the patients who already were symptomatic, so these already had large bleach, bleeds and, and strokes, there, the response was almost completely flat. So it's very severely affected. But even in the pre-symptomatic mutation care, so these are patients who don't have these bleeds and infarcts in the brain yet, already there, the hemodynamic response function or the reactivity of the vessels is uh, massively impaired. So suggesting that this is actually an interesting early marker of the disease that we could maybe use uh, to study the longitudinal consequences of a vessel dysfunction in this context. And then going back to the mice, obviously the uh, the added value of doing this in mice that we can look at single vessels. So we see similar things as in humans, but here we can actually figure out so what is wrong with the individual vessels underlying this phenomenon. And we think it may have to do something with some muscle cell loss. So uh, this is a longitudinal study where we cross these APOP PS1 mice with mice that have green uh, swim muscle cells. So we can actually just quantify the number of swim muscle cells over time in arterioles. And this is through uh, with two photo microscopy at 7, 9, 11, and 13 months of age. Uh, so with two months intervals, we quantify the number of um, muscle cells. And what we see is that in just normal wild types, it's completely normal, nothing is happening. But in transgenics, we see that in the context of increased amyloid, so here in yellow, now we show the amyloid flux. So both the flux and the CAA that accumulates in these vessels uh, tracks very well with loss of some muscle cells. So some areas is completely devoid of some muscle cells. We see that the vessels get a little bit enlarged, so it loses all of its integrity. Um, so we think this may be the underlying phenomenon as to why you see these reduced perivascular clearance as well as reduced reactivity in these animals. And this may also play a role in humans. And then obviously a question is, that do these mice also bleed eventually? Well, yes-ish, but you have to wait quite long. Um, so if we look at 20 months of age, these mice are uh, very, very old. Um, then we start to see subtle uh, leakage uh, sites in some of these animals. And Interestingly, this happens in patients that we observe in humans. So it's at the side where the vessels branch off of the larger vessels into the cortex. And we see And now we have like kind of an outcome marker to um, study in longitudinal studies, kind of the sequence of events leading up to this type of uh, lesion formation. So we can look at clearance, we can look at vascular reactivity, amyloid increase, muscle cell loss, and eventually a bleeding formation to try to unravel what happens first and where we might find possible ways to interfere with this pathing to stop it. So that brings me back to this where we started off with and we can add like these uh, set of tools that we've been able to use to, to get at this um, where we use in vivo optical imaging as a model uh, for this disease process to so not only look at structural alterations but also functional alterations in real time in living uh, animals. And that now allows us to look at the sequence of events leading up to this lesion formation. And hopefully with what we learn from animals, we can go back to humans, and eventually to in vivo, and try to figure out how to stop this in, uh, in our patients. And that brings me to my last slide. And I just want to thank, um, huge thanks to Steve and Brian, who are my mentors. And um, the collaborations here with you guys at the Martino Center has been very pleasant. Thank you so much for welcoming me here. And thank you for your attention.